to say I think that's a pretty cool looking intro. Yeah. I don't like it a lot. Well, good morning. Glad you guys are with us for the start of a brand new series called Walking Dead of the Bible. Now, how many of you guys have watched the series Walking Dead? Anybody in here? A few of you? All right, I have to be honest. I have not. I have not seen a single episode of Walking Dead. Um, the reason is zombies scare <laughs> You think I'm teasing, but I'm serious. Zombies scare the living daylights out of me. And it happened to me just a few years ago. You see, my dad and I, um, we went to go watch a movie. Let me back up the story just a little bit more than that. Because um, we were on vacation, my whole family. And uh, my mom and sister decided to go shopping, right? And so we're hanging out at a shopping mall. And my dad's like, hey, I know what we should do. Let's go watch a movie. And I was like, awesome. I was like, are you paying yeah, even better. <laughs> now, you know when you go to the movies and sometimes you realize that there's nothing good on at the movies? Yeah, when you're already at the mall, that doesn't matter, all right? So we were already there with, with my mom and my sister. We sent them off. We've gone over to the movie theater, and we began to look at the array of movies that were playing. And we had no idea what any of the titles were. None of them. None of them rung any bells about anything, and so we had to begin Googling what the titles of these movies are. First one we Googled, it was some romance chick flick. And not watching that one, right? <laughs> and we kept going and went down all the way through the list until we got to the very last one, and the movie was called Quarantine, right? Now, we looked up in Google, and it was like, hey, some medical outbreak happened to an apartment complex that get contained, that'd be quarantine, and the, can the medical team save them all in time? Right? I mean, it seems somewhat interesting, fascinating, and so we were like, eh, nothing else sounds any good at all, so we'll go in and watch this movie. Now, what the preview forgot to tell us, and what the synopsis forgot to tell us is, is that the medical outbreak was a zombie outbreak, <laughs> And they were all trapped inside of this apartment building, and all the medical team that would go in got eaten by the zombies. And they didn't survive. And I was like, and you know, something about zombies, they do everything they can to make them creepy, right? And so like, there's these moments where like out of nowhere, all of a sudden somebody is snatched in the middle of a hallway and like disappears. And you're like, ah, I don't know what to do. I think I watched about half the movie, right? But I was sitting next to my dad at the time, and my dad, I didn't see him play once. And I was like, oh, if my dad's still here, I'm not good enough to walk out of this thing. <laughs> and I knew that we paid like $15 a ticket to see this movie, and so I knew that he wasn't moving from seeing this movie, right? We were going to sit through the end of the movie because he paid for that money for this, and so we were going to we get out of the movie, and my dad said, oh my goodness. He said, I thought you were going to have to tear me down off the ceiling on that movie. And then he said, but I was worried the zombies were going to get me over the ceiling, so I stayed right where I was at. And I was like, why didn't you say something? I would have left with you. And he's like, well, I'm definitely not sleeping with the lights off tonight. <laughs> Neither of us slept with the lights off that night. And needless to say, I don't do zombies anymore. Now, our series is called Walking Dead of the Bible, but um, it might be a little bit of a stretch to call these zombie stories. All right? Because they are stories about people that died and came back to life. And really, as we were looking at this series, as my wife and I got to talking about it, um, she said what I think is really the most important thing for this entire series that I want you to kind of use as a framework. And that is, she said, I think it's so amazing that God built this huge framework for us to understand the Easter miracle. The story of Jesus that happened. She said it's not just this one-off that drops in the middle of everything and, and we go, oh my goodness, look at that. And we could never comprehend or understand it. She, you know, as we see these stories over and over again, we're going to begin to see that it helps us to unfold a fuller picture and a bigger appreciation for the Easter story. And so over the next five weeks, yeah, Easter's just six weeks away from today. Don't let that sink in, all right? We'll be all right. We've got spring break between now and then. It'll be okay, all right? But, and a lot of spring baseball, okay? But Easter's only six weeks away. So here's what my prayer is, is that over the course of the next five weeks, as we barrel down the runway towards the Easter story, that you would use each of these stories to help build a framework. What is God building? 
to help us understand a little bit more about what Jesus did when he died on the cross and he came back to life again. So, with that, if you've got your Bibles, open them up to um, the book of 2 Kings. 2 Kings, it's in the Old Testament, and we're going to be in chapter 13. 2 Kings chapter 13. Now, the book of Kings, right, there's two of them, um, are part of the historical narrative of the, of the tribe and nation of Israel, right? And it's really, it's the listing of all of the kings. In fact, if they were making a, a movie or a show called Game of Thrones, this is what they should really base it off of, is these two books, because it is story after story of a king who gets overthrown by a set of people, and then the next king comes, and he's even worse than the previous set of kings, and it just goes over and over and over again. It's this Game of Thrones that is played out. And during the midst of all of that, we have these guys who show up that are prophets. And they are there to guide and protect the Israelite people. And they're even there to try to help to instruct the kings about how to follow God. Now, our story today is about one of those two main prophets that are, exist in the book of Kings. His name is Elisha. Now, Elisha, we're actually going to pick up at the very end of Elisha's story. And we're going to see the end of his life. So if you've got it, read with me. We're going to start in verse 14. It says, Now when Elisha had fallen sick with the illness of which he was going to die, Joash, who was king of Israel, went down to him and wept before him, crying, My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. And Elisha said to him, Take a bow and arrows. And so he took a bow, and he took some arrows, and then he said to the king of Israel, draw the bow, and he drew it. So if you're not a big archery person, that means he had to string it right, right, and pull it all up, get it all taut, and then pull it back, because they don't just walk with it pulled taut all the time, all right? Be like, Bonnie, you wouldn't walk around with your muscles all tense and tight all the time, right? We have some relax to them, because if you walked around all tense and tight like that, you'd pull something, it would snap, it would break. It's the same thing with, with, with the archers. And so he draws the string up and he draws it back. And Elisha says, uh, laid his hands on the king's hands. And he said, open the window eastward. And he opened it. And then Elisha said, shoot. And he shot. And he said, the Lord's arrow of victory, the arrow of victory over Syria. For you shall fight the Syrians in Aphek until you have made an end of them. And he said to the king of Israel, now strike the ground with them, that being the arrows. And he struck three times, and then he stopped. And the man of God was angry with him. And he said, you should have struck five or six times, and then you would have struck down Syria until you had made an end of it. But now you'll strike down Syria only three times. And Elisha died, and they buried him. This is the cool part of this whole story. It says, now bands of Moabites used to invade the land in the spring of the year. And as a man was being buried, behold, a marauding band was seen. And the man was quickly thrown into the grave of Elisha. And as soon as the man touched the bones of Elisha, he revived and stood on his feet. Let's pray. God, this morning, as we dig into this story that's here in 2 Kings. God, I pray that you would help us to see the truth that resides in it and the way that it applies to our lives. Father, I pray that um, the same life-giving that it exchanged there for this man who landed on Elisha's bones, Father, that it would uh, exchange in our hearts and that we would walk out of here filled with life back into a world that is filled with death and brokenness, hurt and disillusionment. But I just give you all of the glory. It's in your name we pray. Amen. What an interesting story, right? It's a challenging story. It's one that's really tough to get your head around. So in our group times, 
All right? We talk about the stories before you ever get into this room. So you have a chance. We believe that you have the same Holy Spirit inside of you that's inside of me. Right? So I am not any more gifted at all of this figuring out what's going on in the Bible than any of you are. And so because of that, we give our groups a chance to look at the story ahead of time. And as we were talking about this story, they were all like, whoa, time out. This is a lot to wrap my head around about all the things that took place here. So let me back up just a little bit and help us to wrap our heads around this story. So you have Elisha. Elisha has found out that he's sick with whatever it is that he's going to die of. Now the Bible doesn't tell us how, um, what kind of disease it was that he had, how long that he was going to have for this, right? But it tells us that he was sick. Now, Elisha has been the prophet over Israel for the last 65 years at this point. So he's quite a treasure, right? They know that he is there to guide and to protect and to instruct them. And so word makes it to the king, right? The king finds out Elisha is dying, right? It's about to be the end of Elisha's life. And the king comes to see him. And when the king gets there, the king says this really unusual statement, right? He says, my father, my father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. What in the world? My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. Well, I think these words represent the first part of really what I would call Elisha's challenge for us in this text. I think they represent the word legacy. Legacy. Now, a lot of people have defined what the word legacy means. I like this one as I was reading this week. It said legacy is the imprint you leave on the future. Legacy is the imprint that you leave on the future. You know, when you look at that definition, what you realize is that every single one of us who are sitting in this room, no matter how old or how young we are, no matter what we've done or haven't done, each and every one of us have a legacy. Each and every one of us have a legacy. But here's the problem. Some of us leave our legacy by default instead of by design. Some of us leave our legacy by default instead of by design. Elisha chose his legacy. His legacy was one of design. You say, Charles, how do you know that? What about these words tell you that Elisha's legacy was one that he chose, one that was designed, one that he was fulfilling what it was that God had called him to do? Well, if we flip back into 2 Kings just about 10 chapters earlier, you don't have to go there. You can just take my word, but you can study this later on this week. Chapter 2, verse 12, we see that Elisha says these exact same words before he starts his own ministry. So this is the second time that we've seen these exact same words. Elijah says then to his mentor, when his mentor is being taken up by a chariot of fire with horses made of fire. What a cool sight. And if there's any way to go, a chariot of fire with horses of fire is on my top two list, right? The other way might be just an Enoch. He just walked straight on into heaven. And I think that'd be pretty cool too because fire makes me a little bit nervous. All right. I'm just going to be honest about that. Bad things can happen with fire. On a walk, though, I'm okay with that, too. I probably have to go for more walks if I think that that's the way I'm going to go on into heaven. But So here it is. Elisha says the exact same words. He says, my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and its horsemen. It's the declaration that Elisha makes as his mentor is being taken up into heaven. You say, well, Charles, why is that a big deal? Why does that have anything to do with who it is that Elisha is saying that he wants to be? Why does that have anything to do with what Elisha's legacy is? Well, in the story, just before this moment happened, where Elisha says the same proclamation that is said to him at the end of his life, his mentor looks at him and he says, Elisha, if I could grant you anything, if I could give you anything, what would you like for it to be? Without hesitation, Elisha looks back at him and he says, I want a double portion. 
I want a double portion of what you've done. Now, if you're like me, you read that and you go, whoa, time out, Elisha. That sounds a little bit greedy, right? You want to be twice as great as your mentor? Really, that's what it is that you're asking for in this moment as you're telling this guy that, hey, you were good, but I want to be twice as good as you were? And the problem is, is that's not what he was asking for. You see, in Israel, when you were the firstborn son, when it came time for the inheritance, what it was, the father would pass down to his child. The firstborn got a double portion of the inheritance. And Elisha was saying to his mentor, I think of myself as your spiritual son. And I want a double portion of the ministry that you had to be my inheritance. His mentor says, if you see everything that's about to take place, he says, you can take up my mantle and continue on. And as Elisha watches everything take place, he hollers out, my father, my father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. So these words were all about the legacy. The legacy that Elisha was going to have and that he would be leaving behind. And here is really the deep question of the day. I'm going to drop it right here in the very middle of everything. It probably means that you're not going to pay attention to anything else, the rest of what I say. But that's okay because I really want you to think about this. Because what is it that you want your legacy to be? What is it that you want your legacy to be? And by the way, I'm okay with you not knowing the answer to that right now. I've been thinking about this for the entire week. And I don't have a good answer for you as to what I want my legacy to be. And so for me to say to you in the next five seconds, I want you to know what yours is. And I've got a whole week of wrestling with it. I don't think that's very fair. But here's some things that I know about what I want. I know that I want to raise up two spiritual champions. And by that, here's what I mean. I mean that I want to raise my daughters to stand on my shoulders of everything that I understand spiritually. And for them to begin to grow from there, me as a spiritual platform for them, so that they would tower over me as giants in the faith. That's one of my goals. Here's another one. I want to be found faithful of this church. I know that God has called me and he's called my family here to start this work. And I know that along the way, there are going to be all kinds of things that come up. And we question sometimes, in the midst of the hardness of what it is that we're doing, are we doing the right thing? Are we making any impact in the lives around us? Would people not know that our church is, if we were to be gone tomorrow, would somebody know that our church was ever even here? And at the end, I want to be found faithful. I want my God to say to me, well done good and faithful servant you shepherd over the ones that i sent to you you watched out for them you protected them from the wolves of this world you guided them you helped them to find what they needed to eat along the path and they were more righteous because of being under you now, i'll tell you i know there's going to be moments in time when i fall short of that goal but i pray that that I would be found faithful. I also know that I want to honor my dad in this. I want to honor him in how I love my wife and how I love my kids. You know, one of my favorite sermons is by Martin Luther King Jr. It's called uh, The Drum Major Instinct. The Drum Major Instinct. And he says this. He says, every now and then I think about my own death and I think about my own funeral. And every now and then I ask myself, what is it that I would want instead? He says, tell them not to mention that I have a Nobel Peace Prize. That isn't important. Tell them not to mention that I have three or four hundred other awards. That's not important. Tell them not to mention where I went to school. I'd like somebody to mention that day that Martin Luther King Jr. tried to give his life serving others. 
I'd like for somebody to say that day that Martin Luther King Jr. tried to love somebody. Yes, if you want to say that I was a drum major, say that I was a drum major for justice. Say that I was a drum major for peace. I was a drum major for righteousness. And all of the other shallow things will not matter. I won't have any money to leave behind. I won't have the fine and luxurious things of life to leave behind. But I just want to leave a committed life behind. Martin Luther King Jr. You know, not everybody is given the gift, or some of you may even call it a curse, of knowing that they're about to die. And sure, we all know that that day is going to come. There is a day that we will die. But, um, and as we get older and we approach more towards that, I think we begin to think about this question of legacy more. You know, when I was a sophomore in college, I was taking a class that was called Lifespan Psychology, right? In Lifespan Psychology, you go through all of the stages of life, and you look at all of them, and you talk about the major issues that exist in all of them. And as we got towards the end of the semester, so you can guess where that was, towards the lifespan development, our professor walked up to the front of the board one day, and began writing on the board, and he asked this same question. He said, how many of you have ever thought about death, specifically your death? And what you would have written on your tombstone. Now, we were in college, right? We weren't really thinking about our death and what it was that we would have written as an epithet on our, our grave sites. But as soon as he said the word tombstone, the professor knew something about all of us in that room. Because we all giggled and somebody said it. Because there was a commercial at that time about what do you want on your tombstone? And the commercial was not talking about your grave. It was talking about a pizza. And somebody in the room, not me, not because I didn't think it, but because I didn't say it, <laughs> shouted out, cheese and pepperoni. We all laughed. But such is the mind of a 20 year old, right? We thought more about pizza than we thought about our legacy. But you know, really hearing that kind of lies the problem. Because the problem is, is that at the end of my life, I've already built most of my legacy. In fact, Stephen Covey, he wrote a, a book several years ago called uh, Highly, uh, hi, uh, excuse me, Effective Habits of Highly Effective People. Highly Effective Habits of Highly Effective People. Great book. And in that book, he said, if you don't know what your destination is, you'll never, ever reach it. In fact, he says, you should start with the end in mind before you ever even begin the journey. Zig Ziglar, right? You gotta love Zig Ziglar. He said it like this. He said, if you aim at nothing, you'll hit it every time. If you aim at nothing, you'll hit it every time. You see, when it comes to our legacy, we have to determine our destination. When it comes to our legacy, we have to determine our destination. Look back with me at verses 15 and the following. Elisha said to him, take a bow and arrows. So he took the bow and the arrows. And then he said to the king, draw the bow. And he drew it. And Elisha laid his hands on the king's hands. And he said, now open the window eastward. And he opened it. And then Elisha said, shoot and he shot and then elisha said the lord's arrow of victory the arrow of victory over syria for you shall fight the syrians and aphek until you have made an end of them i think this is the idea of legacy and it's the beauty of this entire passage wrapped up right here because when joash said the words to to elisha my father, my father, the chariot of Israel, Elisha says, all right, son, I'm going to give you an opportunity to choose to determine your destination, your legacy, your path. Because Israel has been plagued over and over again by invading nations. Joash, you have an opportunity to do something and to submit yourself in the history 
of this nation and defeat Syria. And so he says to him to draw the bow and they shoot the arrow out of the window. And it was a declaration of war. When you shot an arrow across into enemy lines, wherever it was that the enemy was, that was a declaration of war. Now it doesn't tell us that the arrow landed over in Syria, but he shot eastward towards Syria. And so I'm going to go with it did. Because it was totally a declaration of war that God makes right here. And he blesses that he will be able to take on. He says, look, you have the arrow of victory going out ahead of you. All you've got to do is just follow behind it. He has a chance to determine his destination in this moment. Now look with me at verses 18 and 19. Elisha says, take the arrows. And Joash took them. And he said to the king of Israel, strike the ground with them. And he struck three times. And then he stopped. And then the man of God was angry with him. And he said, you should have struck five or six times. And then you would have struck down Syria until you had made an end of it. But now, now you will strike down Syria only three times. See, Elisha says to him to take his arrows and stab them into the ground. And he takes them and he stabs them just three times. And then Elisha looks at him and says, you fool. He said, you needed to stake it in the ground as many times as you possibly could. Because here's what happens. Not only do we have to determine our destination, but we have to be willing to defend that determination. I love, Bonnie, that you're sitting here today because when somebody determines that they want to get their life back into some sort of shape, right? Daily, they have to decide to defend that determination, don't they? Because if they don't, if they're not willing to stick an arrow in the ground every single day, then they're not going to make it to that end destination. And the same thing is true of our legacies. Whoever it is that you say, this is who I want to be, this is what I think God has called me to be, and this is what I want to leave to those that come in generations that are after me, this is the kind of impact that I want to make for all of eternity, then you have to be willing to say, I'm going to stick an arrow in the ground on that over and over again on the small things. Billy Graham, right? Stalwart of the faith. He passed away this week. And when it happened, I looked at my wife and I said, God just gave me an incredible illustration to be able to share this week. Not that I was excited for Billy Graham to leave, but I am because I know that he's with my father in heaven and he's rejoicing out of a great time. He's not hurting any longer by any of the pains of this world. And he is hearing, well done, good and faithful servant. And you know why he's hearing that? Because Billy Graham made a determination early on in his ministry. He said, I want to be a man of integrity and character. And here's the arrows that he stuck in the ground. Before Billy ever went into any city, he sent team members ahead of him to the hotel that he was going to stay at. He said, here's what I want you to do in the hotel I'm going to stay at. He said, will you go in and pull out anything, anything that is unholy? He said, take the porn off of the TV. He said, block the cable channels that are bad cable channels. He said, if there's any magazines that are in the room, take them out, throw them away, whatever you need to do, give them back to the hotel. He said, just make sure that there's a Bible in there. That's all that I need. And he sent people in to do that ahead of time. Then he went a step further. He said, here's what I'm going to do. I'm not ever going to meet alone one-on-one -on -one with, with a woman, especially behind closed doors. He said, I'm going to make sure that there's somebody else that's there. Why? Because he was putting arrows in the ground because he knew that he wanted his legacy to be that I'm a man of integrity and a man of character. Do you know the things that people said about him when he passed away? And we lost a man of integrity and a man of great character. A man of God. Why? Because he was willing to defend the determination that he felt like God had called him to, to leave a legacy behind that will impact future generations. People will talk about Billy Graham for hundreds of years to come. Because he was willing to put the arrow into the small stuff. And he didn't lose any ground. When you've determined your destination, you effectively declared war. 
When Billy Graham said, I determined that I want to have integrity, the enemy said, I'm going to throw everything at him I possibly can to keep him from having integrity when it's all done. I want to take his legacy away from him. I don't want him to be a legacy that is designed. I want it to be something that is defaulted into that nobody will talk about. But hang on, because Elisha's legacy gets better. Because Elisha's legacy, look with me at verses 20 and 21, and let's see if we can see some of what Elisha's legacy is. And that may seem a little disconnected at first glance because these two stories, they're not right there in order as far as time goes. But I think they give us a great picture of what his legacy is. In verse 20, it says this. It says, Elisha died and they buried him. Now bands of Moabites used to invade the land in the spring of the year. And as a man was being buried, behold, a marauding band was seen. And the man was thrown in the grave of Elisha. And as soon as the man touched the bones of Elisha, he revived. He stood on his feet and he walked out of that grave. Elisha's legacy was a life-giving legacy. It was a life-giving legacy. You see, when connected to that preceding story, we see that our legacy has a long-lasting and long-reaching effect. This wasn't the very next day that this happened after this went on. There is some time frame that happens between here. Some commentary said it may have even been as much as 100 years that happened between the moment when Elisha was buried and this moment when this man was thrown in. But there's no dis even though there's no direct correlation between this man that was thrown into the tomb and Elisha, there is a connection because Elisha had left behind a legacy of giving life to people. You know, my papa is one of my heroes. He fought in World War II as a pilot. And he flew into um, occupied Germany and rescued Frenchmen and Englishmen and piloted them back into their countries uh, near the very end of the war. But that's not why my, my papa is a hero to me. That's not why I look at his legacy and say that man gave a life-giving legacy. See, my dad grew up without a dad until he was 16 years old. And I don't know about you, but most statistics say that if you have a family that is divorced, that your kids will experience divorce, and that brokenness is generationally cyclical. My grandfather stepped in in the middle of all of that. A 16-year-old dad. And he stepped in, he became dad to my dad. And over the next several years, he invested in my dad's life and began to show him how it was that you loved a woman. He began to show him how it was that you treated your kids. He gave my dad a career. And together, my dad and my grandfather changed what could have been a very terrible cycle in our family of divorce and brokenness. Because my papa put an arrow in the ground and said, no, that's not how this is going to happen in this family. He's like, I'm going to love and I'm going to live in such a way that my dad, my dad said, I don't want my kids to grow up without a dad now. He said, I'm going to love and I'm going to live. He said, I'm going to fight tooth and nail. And he'll tell you, there were moments when I was growing up that he was like, I don't even know what to do in this moment because I didn't have any example for me as a dad as to what to do when you're 13. He said, my mom shipped me off to a farm. Do I ship you off to a farm? I was like, please no. <laughs> but my dad knew that he wanted to leave the same legacy that my papa was leaving. My papa's been in heaven for several years now. But that legacy forever changed my family. My family is not perfect. My home is not perfect. But it is loving. And it is life-giving. 
because of the choices that my papa started and he instilled into my dad and my dad fought tooth and nail for so that I could have the same things. Second thing that Elisha's legacy reminds us of is that death is not our end. Death is not our end. And that's not just because of the fact that the legacy goes on beyond when you're dead. But it's also because God uses this to paint a picture for us of life after death. That the grave is not, it's just a gateway. You see, the tomb of Jesus that we're going to see in just a couple of weeks is not the end of the story. In fact, it's really just the beginning of the story for every one of us that are here in this room. For those who say, I choose to follow Jesus. And Jesus says, that's just the beginning. Here's the Elisha challenge in its fullness today. The Elisha challenge is this. Begin living your legacy today so that you leave a lesson for tomorrow that brings life that lasts. And the question is, are you willing to take up the Elisha challenge? Don't shoot the arrow unless you're willing to stick the arrow. And do it over and over again. That's the type of a legacy that Elisha had, right? He lived a legacy each and every day. So that he left one for the future generations. And it was one that was life-giving. It's the type of legacy that Martin Luther King Jr. lived. He lived out his legacy every day. He staked down every time that he could so that there would be life in the future. He dreamed of a life. It's the kind of legacy that Billy Graham left. It's the kind of legacy that my papa left. It's the kind of legacy that I think my dad is still leaving today. It's the kind of legacy I hope to leave one day. What about you? Are you willing to take up Elisha's challenge? Are you willing to take up your bow, shoot it at the enemy, and stake as many arrows in the ground as you possibly can to defend the destination that you have in mind? Let's pray. There may be somebody in here today, you're, you're like, you know, Charles, that's really great, but you said something about the grave is not the end, and I don't... I don't understand what you're talking about. There's two things I want to say to you. Number one, come back. Come back and keep listening to the stories as, as we continue to unfold them and talk about that. Number two is, is if you're serious and you're like, I really want to know more about how to have this eternal life thing that you're talking about today, where the grave is not the end of my story, but it's really just the beginning. But I want to encourage you, just come find me after the service. I'll be here in the back. I'd love to talk with you more about that. I'd love for you to have the same life-giving legacy that's been passed down to me. Father, I just, I thank you. I thank you for this message today. I thank you for the opportunity to get to share it with those that are in this room. And God, I know that when we walk out of these doors, there are going to be lives that are going to be rocked. Because God, that, the world out there doesn't want us to live this kind of a legacy. It's broken, and it wants us to be broken. It doesn't want us to understand that we're designed. It wants us to be in default mode of all the brokenness. But God, I pray that right now, right here in this moment, in this place, that we would put a stake in the ground and say, that's not who I want to be. It's not who I think God's called me to be. I want to take up the Elisha challenge. God, I want to take up the Elisha challenge. that I could bring life to generations that come. 